Hello and welcome to Women of Worth Wednesday. I am Gamelin Condi, your host, and I am so grateful that today is finally here because I've been looking forward to this conversation with my special guest today, Lisa Sabi, for a long time. I I'm connected with her sister, Margaret, and so I love when friends turn into new friends, and I definitely feel that way with, with Lisa. We are going to pause just a minute and, and let everyone find the live feed, and we're going to invite you to share if you're watching live where you're watching from. We love to see how our High Five Women of Worth community is global. And we're grateful that you have this opportunity to join us live. But if you're watching on the rebroadcast, uh, we're, we're happy you're joining us as well. I already see England is watching. So that means we're, we're in good company, right? The other side of the pond is connected to us. We have so much to share today and to discuss. And, and Lisa and I share, I think, a common why for our missions and the work we're doing we just get to approach them in different ways. And I love that the Lord really inspires women of worth all over the world to build the kingdom in, in their ways. And I, so I value that for some of you, it, that is because you are really good at baking and I am not really good at baking. <laughs> or you're really good at decorating cakes and I'm not really good at decorating cakes. But Lisa, you're really good at making movies. Is that true? <laughs> Well, I, I'm probably really good at having ideas. And then oh. my son, Josh, is a film director and, and he takes the ideas and our, my connections and he makes them into movies. So I guess my, my, my perspective is that of a vision and idea and passion that we've got to make a change and we can't let the status quo main, be maintained. And so I am a visionary and then I have people who are workhorses to make it into a movie. So And you share that a little bit in common with your older sister, Margaret. Is that true? You both have found that path. I find it fascinating because I think it's not producing and piloting projects like this for film are is is generally not been a female dominated uh, right. field. And so in one family, what happened in your childhood or in your family that this is kind of a shared common path? It's totally coincidental. Okay. We talked about it and we think we had a dad who would launch into projects and who loved the world and loved the differences in the world. I think we were raised to question and raised to seek understanding and, and raised to open up our heart to the world. And I think that somehow percolated into launching into making movies. If you're not familiar with Margaret, who we keep referencing, she was a past guest on Women of Worth with an amazing filmmaker from Africa. And Heart of Africa is their latest project. And I know it's out on DVD. And, and I, I do agree that I also was raised in a home where we, we were encouraged to be curious about other people, especially those that were different than us. And that has been a gift that served me my whole life already because it doesn't scare me. It, it's, it's intriguing. So what was your very first taste of like, I see a problem and I think a film would be the best way to address this problem. What was that first uh, issue that you wanted to bring attention to? Yeah, so I had a daughter who had major mental illnesses and we went through seven years of trying to get therapy and pretty much being locked out as parents in her therapeutic journey. Um, she was in many different uh, eating disorder centers and we just kept trying to, we, I read all the books and I kept thinking, why are parents not more involved? And I was frustrated. And at one point she ended up leaving family and faith and I told my husband, I said, I've got to find meaning. And he said, you do whatever it takes. So I started making movies. And I, I said, I've got to make sure that parents who have a child with anorexia know what they need to know at the onset. So they're not at the end of the journey or at the, not the end of the journey, but years into it. And they still don't know that they should be involved and that all the research sho shows that parents should be involved in the therapy of a child with, me with mental illnesses. And so I made my first one just two parents who have a child with anorexia. And, then, and, what a, and what a complex issue. I mean, within mental health, I, I feel the same way about suicide work and with my sister's death that, you know, six 
years, six and a half years ago, when my first book was written and Meg died, there wasn't a lot, especially within the LDS market, to discuss this issue. And I'm so enthused by there's much more discussion on mental health now than there ever was. But whether it's an eating disorder, depression, anxiety, OCD, uh, addictions, whatever we're talking about, I think you bring up such an important point that when you're the parent, right? When you're the parent and you're trying to do what parents want to do, which is give their kids every resource possible to be successful, happy, and whole, and there's a system that kind of is built towards not encouraging that, and then you can't be the home base, right? Whether your child's in treatment or not, they have to have a home base and you're not part of that solution. Uh, it, it, it is a weakness, right? It's a weakness to the system. Absolutely. So how many children do you have? Six. Six kids. Yes. And so I, I'm going to get emotional about this because I have two. I, I, I wasn't supposed to have any. So oh. my, my two children are miracles. My son is 22 and he's six foot seven. So we count him <laughs> as two kids because he's so tall. And then I have a 16 year old daughter and it took six years between those two to get them. But what I learned a lot while my son was a teenager is all those things I thought I knew about parenting <laughs> went right out the window. Like I was very aware pretty quickly once he hit that teenage zone and probably even sooner that all the judgments or all the things I thought I knew about parenting kids uh, wasn't what I thought at all. And then you have a second kid. So I often say, cause sometimes he will try to co-parent with his sister and he'll try to give advice. And I will often say to him, you know, dad and I have changed because we've raised one child, but we are also now raising a child different than the first child. So if you have six kids, you've probably had six very unique parenting experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're exactly right. And often all the parenting books are parenting a child whose brain is normal. Right. And you have to throw that away when your child has a mental illness. Yes. You work in a very different way and you have to learn compassion when they don't seem to deserve compassion. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, a, a it's painful. Very, it's a, it's a, a very educational journey to right. have children. For when, sure. my, when my son hit 13 to 15 about, we called the angry years and, uh, we, you know, we don't check big boxes of things that, but, but there were some rough things happening and he, I've written about him in some of my books and I speak about him. So he knows he doesn't really have secrets around that. But I remember feeling like for his privacy, I couldn't talk about some of the things that were really hard at the time we called ministering sisters, visiting teachers, and they would sometimes show up and they could hear the, the conflict in the home. And we were trying to find answers for certain situations. And, and I remember feeling after we kind of passed through that stage that I talked to two other women who had kids similar age going through some similar things. And that really is the genesis for, for my very first book. I wrote it because I thought I just needed one friend. I just needed one person to say, you know what, me too, without sharing my son's personal experience in a way that violated his privacy, but I needed support. So for me, it started with books that led to speaking and media, but for you, film was a way to put a conversation together. Yes. Did your kids appreciate that you wanted to talk about these things or not? Oh, oh yes. Oh yes. And they have all been a part of it. My daughter's even in the film about the anorexia, um, she wrote everything that the eating disorder was telling her in her brain. So part of the movie is her writing and, uh, and she would look through it and help me. So, uh, and I, you know, I think that the idea of trying to protect people uh, by not talking about it also can uh, unexpectedly and innocently backfire by making it feel shameful. Right. And so right. The, more, the more we can truly say, you know what, I am going to be an open book and I'm going to truly open up and love and I accept that you will love me back no matter where I am and no matter where my children are, that we are going to be a people who do not judge each other, but who embrace the, whatever journey the person is on. And that is what, uh, and that's really what I've in this last movie, American Tragedy, is getting to know Sue Klebold, 
who, uh, you know, people who don't know who she is, you know, she's a very, she's a tall, beautiful woman, very classy looking. She wears long earrings. If there's a spider in her house, she goes and puts it outside. She doesn't stomp on it and kill it. Um, and she's also the mother of a mass murderer. She's a right. mother of Columbine shooter, Dylan. And that is a perfect, what you shared about why we have to talk about these things is exactly my why and, and my passion as well to talk about the uncomfortable things. So we dispel the shame and we, we give permission for all of us to be more open because that's what saves our lives and our families. And I love that segue thought into the fact that um, let's jump right into American tragedy and the Columbine. I remember it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50, so this isn't a long, long, this feels like last week when it was happening. And for some reason, this story captivated uh, the, world. I, the world in a different way than any other mass shooting. And yeah. I think as time has gone on, it's because we wondered how do, I think we, the questions were, how do we get to this point? And with every tragedy, there's quick to blame, right? There's quick Absolutely. to blame, quick, quick point fingers and this is the reason or this was the fallout and this is the teacher that didn't see something or this is the um this is the parent you know we didn't know a lot about dylan's mom back then and she's become more of did you feel that same judgment with your own children and and then and then what did, what have you learned by doing this project getting to know her specifically and her story you know, I I didn't feel judgment of my daughter. I had anorexia when I was 13, and I think I kind of was expecting it and was prepared for it. At, at least, no, I really wasn't prepared for what happened, but prepared that she would have anorexia. And uh, so I didn't feel judgment, and I was very comfortable in being open and talking to people. Um, now, of course, and I remember Sue Klebold. I remember when Columbine happened. I live seven miles away from Columbine. And I remember when it happened that uh, there was a lot of blame. How could the parents not know? How can you not see a trench coat on your son in, the, in a warm day and realize there's a problem? And she was bad at. She was condemned. She was sued. She went through the nightmare of, the nightmare of nightmares. And uh, she really decided that I'm not going to keep this secret. I'm not going to hide this under. I'm not going to be hidden the rest of my life because of what my son did. And so she, although she judges what he did was horrific, she does not judge him as a somebody she doesn't love. She loves her son even now. In fact, when she was asked, if you were to ask, talk to Dylan again, what would you ask him? And her response was, how could I loved you in a different way so you would have felt it? I think that says so much about who Sue is. She, uh, she knew, she had a sense of a mission. She's told me that she could not choose not to write her story. And she did the research and she read through her son's um, journal and she saw the basement tapes, which are horrific. I watched, the ba I watched something that was like the basement tapes for about 15 seconds. And I said, no, I don't need to do that. That is not something I want to be a part of. But how how our viewers know what the basement tapes are? Yes, the basement tapes are tapes that Dylan and Eric, the two Columbine shooters, produced over a year in preparation for this massacre that they had planned. And um, Sue sought out experts and read books and then she decided to write her story. And her story is a very vulnerable book called A Mother's Reckoning, wherein she explains how many things she didn't notice and what she wishes. And then I met her after she wrote the book and uh, we started having lunch every month and I grew to deeply respect her as a person and as a mother and as an author. And I asked her, would she give our story to us? Because both Sue and I really wanted a, dis a different discussion, a paradigm shift in the mental health world. And that is we cannot wait for, a, for something to happen before we treat it. We cannot wait until we see someone becoming depressed or until we see someone not able to deal with life or someone start to become so thin that they are 
that they are gaunt and can't interact well with life. We cannot wait for that point. That is way too late. We have got to say, yes, we need to deal with mental illness as early and as best possible. But if we don't change the paradigm to a paradigm that says every single person in the universe can use mental health skills that are available, science-based, and helpful for everyday life. If we don't change that paradigm that every person needs mental health and needs to know mental health skills, we will never get ahead of the game. We will always be doing intervention and not prevention. And I, I, I love what you're saying. And, and there's so many things I just wanna say amen to because the way I've always talked about mental health is that it's education for our relationships and our souls and our brains. Absolutely. And so we don't, we don't snub anyone who says I want higher education, we applaud them. And yet when it comes to mental health, there's still the shame factor around it. And I love what you share about Sue and how she didn't see it. I don't know a harder job on the planet than being a parent. I don't, I don't know a more complicated, more important, more emotionally draining and fulfilling job than parenthood. But I will say that you know, I love that she framed it as that the question she would ask is, how could I have loved you more? Do you have a sense from this project from Lunches with Sue that, and your own journey where you've been able to reconcile, and this is my own confession here, my own personal wrestle with owning my ch children's decisions and, and being teachable because it takes a lot of courage to sit down with your kids and say, okay, that's your experience, right? If she was to have that conversation with her son, and it's because I'm having conversations with my adult child right now, uh, his perspective of why mom and dad did what they did is not necessarily what we were intending. And, and we thought so often we were doing exactly the right thing. And we, we try to be open that we made mistakes and we went to therapy and we tried to get him therapy. And yet I can see he still, he still has a story playing. Does she have a sense or do you want to comment on this? That reckoning of parents that are hesitant to say that, to sit down and say, Hey, can you talk to me about what more we could have done? or what your perspective of what your parents did to love you or support you and not go into ownership of that. Oh, Does that have to make sense? Yeah. So you're just, how do you deal with a child who has a narrative? Yes. That is um, perhaps a little critical or, the or, parent? or parents that are hesitant to have the conversation because they don't want to be told it's their fault. You know, no. I can see that her and Dylan sitting down I would hope and pray that what he would say to her is, mom, it was me. You were loving me the best you could, but you know, this is what was happening in my head. I would pray that that's what would happen. And then she could sit there and say, okay, but Dylan, you, it wasn't getting through. What more could we have done? Right. Mm -hmm. And he has a different, in my faith, in your faith, he has that perspective maybe now. Right. Uh, he, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I believe he absolutely does. And there have been some beautiful experiences that Sue actually has had that I don't feel free to share where um, she has felt Dylan and she has felt um, his love for her. Because I know my mom and my sister in her case and with me and loving my sister, we did, she had a great therapist. She had a great bishop. She had friends and family. Everyone had, and in her letter when she wrote that, before she took her life was very much about this isn't on you. It was, it's me. Right. And so I guess my question is really, how do we encourage parents to maybe have that conversation before there's a crisis? So yeah. they're not afraid to hear and go into the guilt. Cause that, that takes so much skill to sit with your kids and have them say, mom and dad, this is what I think okay. about what's going on. And, and that's, that's what has to happen and it's what is incredibly scary. But if we can have a heart that is humble as we go towards our child, realizing we all make mistakes, period. We all are imperfect, period. But our heart loves, and I love, you know, no, no success can compensate for failure in the home. And I've talked to many people who have a child who's left faith. And I've said, but that success is love. It's not a child in the faith is that you have loved a child regardless of where they are. 
Right. And that, that love. And that quote is kind of taken out of context because if you read the before and the after of that quote, it really was an invitation to not stop loving, right? right. It right. wasn't the failure was stopping the loving. It wasn't the it wasn't the action of the child. And I often say to myself, the scriptures are filled with imperfect families. I don't read one story of one family, no. not one in the whole scriptures, whether you're uh, LDS or you're not, you read the Book of Mormon, you don't, you, you could just start with Adam and Eve and you had two boys, one killed the other boy. And if you don't read scripture, just go to God. He's the perfect parent and he has a good significant number of his kids that don't make choices that love his other kids. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. So we've, got, we've got to get out of that, right? Yeah. And the first thing is just acknowledge, yeah, I was imperfect and I am sorry. And then anything I have done that has hurt you, I am sorry. And just accept that and not feel like I have to be protective. It's like, you know what? I did do things wrong. And I understand that your brain is complex. During the teenage years, the brain is pruning. It is so hard for a young man to connect well with a child, with a parent. And if we started understanding that, yeah, this is hard for you too. How can we make it where we can talk together? How can you help me help you? What type of ways of my talking with you will you accept? You you are you. You teach me. How can I connect with you? And put it in a in a in the um, arena of I want to learn how to be a better, better parent. You teach me how to parent you because you are the one who knows that. Wow. Lisa, I don't think there's anyone, the, no matter the age, that can't still have that conversation. Absolutely. You know, I don't care if your kid is 22 or 50, which I am. I can have the same conversation with my parents now to say, hey, this is how you can support me. What a hopeful message. What yeah. did you learn in doing American Tragedy that you um, want to make sure we we know so that so that we watch it and we learn? Because we've talked about a, a number of things. First and foremost, that mental health has to be the priority instead of after the trauma that we right. have the conversation. Right. What else have you learned from this project? Well, I've learned wonderful women who truly faced their fears and like Sue and went towards them and identified them and talked through them and wrote about them and opened up that that has power. I learned that we, when we get to know others, almost no matter what their story is, we can learn to love them. In fact, love often is the easiest feeling when you get to know a person's story. And that it's not just Sue's story in American Tragedy. It's Sue and two suicide loss survivor moms and a mom who had a child who was violent. And all of them deeply love their children. And all of them are deeply brave in saying, this is my story. I want it to bless the world. And I am going to become a better person because of my story and not let it make me want to hide in a fetal position. It's a story of empowerment. It's a story of hope. And it's a story of wonderful women who face their fears. Wow. What have you found that allows you to stay hopeful for the future? Because I feel like we're with a community right now that, that in large part understands what's coming and that we're, we're preparing for the Savior to come again in the Christian faith that's shared. Um, and I've been with COVID-19 and fires and race riots and political discord. There's so much playing out right now that, you know, we, it does behoove us to go back and look at Columbine and other situations of trauma and say, what are the lessons going forward we can learn? But what helps you go forward in some really hopeful ways that allows you to know that you know, God's aware and he's there because this community in other media, you may not be able to speak as freely about faith, but what are your thoughts on God? And then make sure we know where people can find this film. I see that Josh has posted uh, the link, but th that's kind of where I'd love to end our conversation today. I believe God is in control and, and he was part of making this movie and meeting Sue and Lisa and and Laura and um, Liza. He was part of all of this. And I have hope, COVID and racial tensions and mental illnesses, there's so much out there that we can be fearful. 
But if we face our fears with love, with faith, with commitment to not give up and go forward, seeking understanding, seeking humility, seeking conversation, we will be in a world of connections, of hope, and of progress. And I really believe that the future is bright for those who can do that. And if we don't foster that connection, we're all lost. You know, I often quote that the when people ask why Meg died by suicide, I say, the scriptures say that the hearts of men will fail them. And I think we're watching that play out. And, and to me, the only antidote is what you've talked about, which is faith and love and really sitting with each other and seeing each other's story. I'm so grateful that Sue was able to get to a place yeah. where we could know her. Yeah. Because she had a choice probably a hundred times to go quiet or to go forward into sharing. And what a gift to have her perspective because she's not the only mother of a child that has done a horrific act of murder. And yet we rarely learn from the mom. And, and this is not to be disrespect, disrespectful, but I tell my kids all the time, I'm the person on the planet that will take a bullet for you. And in many ways, Sue has done that for Dylan. Yeah. Oh, and all these other mothers have said, I'll put myself out there. And because I'm a public figure, I know I get horrible comments as much as I get good comments, right? And and she and these other mothers and you as well have said, I'll take a bullet for my child. What a gift. And uh, I want to just tell about a special thing tonight at seven o'clock yes, on, on our Facebook page, Crystal Miller, who was in the library when Dylan and Eric came and shot it up and she saw classmates being carried out, carried out dead and severely injured. And she's experienced suicide of friends from um, Columbine community. And uh, she was under the desk four months before that she committed her life to God. And now she is a spokesperson for Samaritan Purse. And she goes around the world when there's mass trauma. And she's been to Parkland and Sandy Hook and all, most of the school shootings here in the United States, giving hope because of faith and letting them know her story of being under that uh, library table for seven and a half minutes and seeing the horrific act and coming out eventually after working towards her story, understanding it, finding meaning in it, and then opening up about it, she has found great freedom in spreading faith in Christ. And she will be talking along with Miles Atcox tonight at 7 o'clock on American Tragedy Facebook page. So people can get a bonus Women of Worth, kind of, because the conversation needs to keep going. So thank you. Thank you for being here, for your generosity of spirit, your honesty, and for your willingness to, you know, you put skin in the game and making sure that we keep these conversations going. And I think I, there's been so many takeaways from our conversation for just a few minutes. I know this interview can be shared and facilitate healing in families in a ripple effect way. and. I, I hope people will search out the film because I know you talk in detail about mental health help in a very hopeful way. And I think sometimes we, you know, I always say hope is a plan B. And so those watching today are sitting here thinking, I know we have statistically someone that is suicidal right now watching this. Absolutely. And they're like, I don't have, I've tried everything. I've been to therapy. I've done this. I've done that. Faith for me isn't working. I know that in conversations on High Five Life, this conversation with you and then watching the film, that's how God talks to us. That's how God says, try this plan B. Plan A didn't work. Let's try plan B. So thank you, Lisa. Thank and you for will, being willing to help facilitate the plan Bs, the ideas of trying one more thing. And I want people to watch the movie. People are scared to watch it. Some people say it, it's too fearful. It's a hopeful movie. We hear the story. It's Sue's story, not Dylan's story. And it can be, you can buy it or rent it on Amazon Prime. But it's a story of hope. It's not a story of despair. It's a story of women who have been through the, the hell that suicide or mass murder or violence of a child would cause a mother to go through. But it's a story of women who have come out 
brighter, more faithful, deeply good, and it's a story of hope. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for all of you that have joined. I I'm, I feel your prayers and your thoughts as we've been talking, and I hope that the Spirit has directed our conversation in a way that's answered some of those prayers. And I invite you, I, I echo what Lisa just said, that to go to Amazon Prime and watch this. I know I've written some books that people don't want to pick up because of the title, and then they sit and wait on someone's shelf, and then I hear six months later, oh, I finally read it. It was exactly what I needed. And so I hope people will watch this film because – it's such an important conversation. And listen, the headlines play every day where it's another person's family. But I don't know a family on the earth today not being challenged at some level. And so we really do need to talk uh, more openly so we don't judge. Well, that family must have gotten here because of this A, B, or C. We don't know. We don't always know what is really playing out. And the families we think have it all together are quietly struggling. And those that are a disaster, like I think Sue has shown, uh, become the source of inspiration and hope. So thank you, Lisa. I so feel like my life is better because I know you and the work that you're doing. And uh, so prayers for you that this movie just spreads. Okay, Nolan, thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. It's a work that we all need to combine together and link hands and and make a difference. So thank, thank you. you. And thank you for those of us that are here today live for joining Women of Worth Wednesday Live. You are a beautiful community and and high five life for allowing us to bring this pro this show to you each week. We'll see you again next Wednesday on Women of Worth Wednesday.